Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 3 Take, where we talk all things Major League Baseball. Here's Kyle Corwin and Nate Reyes. It all starts right now. All right, we are here with World Series champion, Ooh. College World Series champion, Ooh. and I would argue most important, uh, 2008 AAU 15U national champion. Shout out, <laughs> shout out MVTBL stars, our friend Josh Boers. Josh, how you doing? How's it going, guys? It's been a minute. Uh, for those of you that don't know, because I feel like I've mentioned it a time or two on the podcast already, Josh and I played travel ball back when we were in eighth grade 08 that would have been eighth grade that would have been yeah. going right into high school and then that's pretty much where i peaked and i mean i went on to play college ball but josh went on to do much bigger and better things uh as i mentioned college world series champ and now world series champ you know we're gonna get into the talk about the the world series stuff but let's let's look at what went into that process and I'm gonna open up. I'm gonna open up by asking you about this whole creed thing. I just we need to get that out there. We need to get that out there right off the top. Explain to me what this whole creed business was about because that took over the baseball world. All right, so a lot of monotony, right? Long season. Um, we we listen to music before the game. It kind of fluctuates. Uh, we hit a I don't know how many games in a row we lost, like ten or eleven. So Andrew Heaney was just like, we need to mix this up. We need to mix mix up the mixtape and turns on Creed. And I think we turned around and snapped off like five in a row, something really good. And then it just slowly started to stick, like more guys wanted to listen to it. Uh, and, you know, I think he put it out to the public and then, you know, our, all our fans started singing it during the game. But uh you know, nothing crazy was came out of it, but it was more of just kind of naturally occurring. You know, like I said, a lot of monotony. It's a long season and just kind of breaking it up, something you haven't heard in, what, 10, 15, 20 years? I mean, it's a pretty old song. Uh, but, you know, it's just kind of took our minds off the game and, you know, made us closer as a team, I guess. You know, nothing, nothing crazy. Was it received well by everybody? Because I feel like Creed it, could be it, it, rather it polarizing. It took a while. Okay. It took a while. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you get a little superstitious with winning and losing. And we played it and we won that first game after losing 10. I don't know how many it was. But, you know, then we're like, got to listen to it. Win. Got to listen to it. And we just kept kept winning. So can't change it what's, what's working, right? So that keep it sense. simple. Play Creed. Are you guys aware um, that like they I they're like back on tour now because of this? I hope like so. Creed is like they're <laughs> they going they, all in now. I will say they went to a game I think against Houston and we got uh, absolutely yeah. clobbered. <laughs> I remember seeing that. I was like, yeah, so, that's they finally come yeah. out of hiding. That's not a that's not a good look for them. We like your music, just don't come to the games, you know. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, I mean, that's kind of like with that's like with the Phillies. Uh, that what's his name, Calcum Scott or whatever, the dance on my yeah, own. The guy yeah. got like a billion streams off, off that just from like Philly fans. And yeah, then you I'm got, pretty sure that was my wedding song. <laughs> you, got, <laughs> you got all of Texas just single handedly reviving creeds. I mean, I don't know how much or how little they needed the help, but I mean, single handedly just bringing them back to the spotlight. So I'm all I'm all about it. I'm a fan. Um. You mentioned the Astros. What was the what was the vibe around the clubhouse? Um coming down the stretch, you know, the the divisions kind of slipping away, and then the last day of the season, you know, obviously it it slips through the yeah. cracks a little bit. Uh, I mean, listen, that team's been the best team in our division for ten years now, you know, per se, close. Um so we knew that, you know, the ball was in our court the whole time and we didn't have the easiest schedule, but we had, we had our chances against the angels, right? Uh, we, had, we had four games against them. And I think we had four games against uh, Seattle to close it out. Um, you know, we didn't play super well in LA. So I think we only took one game, right? And we needed, we knew before the Seattle, we had to win two to get in, to, 
two to uh, clinch. Um, but lost the first game on in the eighth inning. Really frustrating for us because they, you know how the clubbies prepare. They tarp the whole uh, clubhouse. So we were coming in. And you could see that they were taking it off. So it kind of kind of upset us a little bit that we didn't get to cherish that moment. And I think we lost game two. Three games set, four games set. We won the second to last day. Um, and um, obviously we celebrated, enjoyed it, but we knew we knew we had to win on, on Sunday. And so came into that game locked in. I mean, no one really partied. We celebrated. You know, we, we sprayed champagne everywhere, drank some beer. But, you know, next day everyone was ready to roll. And, you know, honestly, they just beat us. And they won one nothing. Kirby pitched. I mean, I felt like he could have pitched all nine. He just dominated us. Uh, you know, but I think that loss and us not clinching us, clinching it fueled us because we had a five-and-a-half-hour flight from Seattle to Tampa, and I think we were just really upset. We, we were just sulking in it the whole flight. You know, we didn't get our five days off in Texas like we wanted to. Um, so, you know, I think – I think it worked out in our favor. Obviously, we won. But, you know, I, I, I think just that loss on the last day of the year to get you that clinch really fueled us and it put us to a different level. I think our focus, you know, our, our I mean, I call it pissiness, but we were pissed every single day. Every time, every game we had to play, we were just, we were a different breed. You know, we were relaxed and come game time, we were just ready to kill everybody. I wanted to ask you, because, like, obviously, the whole, I don't, I think there's some baseball fans that either hate or use this term all the time, but like the team that's early, right? Like they're performing before they were expected to show up kind of thing. Obviously the Rangers were kind of slept on, you know, just, I know they made some big moves in the off season, brought on some big guys, but like, Hey, they're not quite ready yet. We're not expecting them to do much. And then you guys just take off in the first half. What was it like kind of coming back down to earth? Like kind of walk me through what it was like saying, okay, like, hey, maybe we are a little too early for this. Maybe we are a little too young. Like what was the thought going on? Like what was the clubhouse like? I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think even in 2022, we were top five scoring offenses, right? So like we already had that on – pretty much on lockdown and Simeon and Seager didn't even have great years. Right. So I think going into 23, we knew the weakness was going to be our pitching, right? It was like, how, how many innings can our starters eat? What's our depth look like in the bullpen? So I think, I think the first half of the year, I mean, I know if we look at winning records against the opposing teams, the first half against us was a lot easier, a lot of losing records, you know, a lot of double ups against, you know, the Royals play the A's a lot. So, you know, I, I think we were we, – we dominated for two straight months. We absolutely hit the crap out of the ball. We pitched enough to win games. Um, but uh, I think we came out of the all-star break still doing okay. We were starting to skid a little bit. I think guys were wearing out. Me personally, I was I was toast at the all-star break. Um, and you start playing good teams and you play them a lot. And, you know, that's when the grind starts. You know, I, I think first two months of the season – pretty relatively easy i think most people would agree and it's, you get in those dog days the last two three months and your body feels awful every single day and you're just you know you just try to put your head down and look but you know i don't think there was ever too much doubt about how good we could be uh we just kind of knew you know our ebbs and flows of the game we, we were just really struggling at that time and you know we knew we just had to get through it stay close you know I think that was the benefit of us having a large lead in the first half was we were able to struggle and we weren't able like we didn't we didn't have to put pressure on ourselves because we still had time you know and you know sure enough we didn't win the division but you know it happens in baseball and it's hard and you know I think Houston played extremely well for the last two months and we just didn't you know so I think you, you just got to know that it's a long season there's going to be those those times where nothing goes right for you ever right and you just got to keep going with it stick with it and you know stick together as a team and I think that was the biggest part for us was we stuck together the whole time you know I think when we were losing the guys were still the same when we were winning we were still the same and just being that cohesive group you hear that a lot but I mean our team had fun 
we had fun. We competed. We did stuff off the field together. And I, I think that's why we won because those moments never got too big or too low. And we just kind of stayed even the whole way through. You mentioned the group that you're playing with. You would obviously be able to speak to it better, but from our perspective, that looked like a rather fun bunch to be around. What Talk to me a little bit about what that group was like on the field, off the field, in those lows, in those highs. Like, well, I mean, you, you mentioned it yourself. A monotonous, long season. You, I'm sure you need some some fun mixed in there, and it seems like that got, that group was a good bunch for that. I think just the pure competitiveness of our team, no matter what it was, was was what made it fun. I mean, we played cards, ping pong, any game you could imagine. Like, we have a little hoop on the wall. You, you got guys betting. Um, I think just those little games where, you know, that switch of I'm going to win this constantly never ends, you know. So you play some ping pong, you know, you compete, you try to beat them, and then you go take it into the game. So we just never – that switch never turned off. And I think, you know, see why the people he brought in, everybody was a dog. You know, everybody wanted to win. You know, no one was rude. Good families, good people. And, uh, you know, everyone kept it pretty light. You know, there's no real screamers. Um, we just kind of did our thing and just stay together. I want to, let's, let's, let's give you an opportunity to support a dude that probably gets entirely too much hate from baseball fans. Ooh. If you were, so, I mean, I would, if you were to try to flip the script yeah. on Jacob deGrom and just flip the script on like yeah. who he is and like get fans to understand like, Hey, this guy is legit. Like, what would you say to like try and change the minds of fans that are like, he can't stay healthy. He's not yeah, worth I mean, it. Like all this kind of stuff. I mean, one, he's one of the greatest people I've ever met. Like he signed, a, I don't know how much money, a lot of money, $175 million contract, I think. Right. And he walks in the clubhouse and you wouldn't know that. And I think he's just one of the nicest, genuine guys, great family, likes to have fun, hangs out with everybody. Um, but, I mean, listen, starting pitching is hard, one. You know, so injuries are always going to occur. But I think he just kind of had one of those. He was with the Mets. The Mets were in that winning phase of their of their group. And he just wanted to come back every single time. And he just felt like he may have rushed it, you know, and – he even tried to do it for us because he's that kind of guy. He's a competitor and he wants to be out there. I don't know how many times he he said, like, this is this is the worst thing for me, just sitting out here watching. Uh, so say that he's happy about being hurt is just the most off thing you could say about the guy because he's he wants to be out there. And, I mean, obviously we want him out there because I don't think I've seen a pitcher in my life that's like him. The guy is just. He could wake up and throw 100. He could wake up and not pitch for three months and still be the greatest pitcher I've ever seen. I mean, it's it's electric. It's special. Um, unicorn, you know. So, yeah, I think there is a lot of hate for him about his injuries. But, again, it's, it's sports and stuff's going to happen. And he had, what, four consecutive years with 200 innings? Like, I don't think people understand the toll that – that causes people. And then you include the playoffs for those Mets teams. You know, he's pitching two or three times, throwing 120 pitches in October. Uh, so I think, you know, it just, just warm out. It happens to a lot of guys, you know, uh, I think when you're the best pitcher in the, the game, right. You, and you're hurt, you're going to get more hate. Just, it's just natural when you're the best, there's always haters, right. The better you get always more. Uh, and I think, it just shows how good he is, but it is frustrating to watch how, how people talk about him. And, you know, it's, I think, I think this was the best thing for him. It's going to give him a year, a whole year off, right? Get that body right, you know, and just restart it. I think if you get three, four years out of Jacob deGrom healthy, it's worth it. It's worth every penny. Cause that dude is, <laughs> he's special. Yeah. Give me a little peek behind the curtain because you mentioned earlier like you were toast by All-Star break and you're talking about, you know, the the wear and tear of a 200 inning season, that kind of thing. Like talk to me a little bit about obviously the arm gets fatigued 
duh, like throwing a baseball is so unnatural, like according to our anatomy. But talk to me a little bit about like what that wear and tear is. Like, is it the legs? Is it the back? Like, what is it? It's everything. You know, I think those first two months, you kind of feel good, right? You feel great. Body's moving good. You know, you recover well. But then it just slowly, you know, day by day, just kind of catches up with you. And, you know, throwing 97 used to be at 80%. Now throwing 97 is at 90%, right? So there's just that more more effort. You're going to get more tired when you start trying hard. And then it, and then it kind of gets into your mental aspect of, man, I'm getting tired. I need to throw this pitch better. And it's it's that tough part of managing effort and control, right? You start trying to max out how hard you throw, start spraying balls. These dudes don't miss. So it's it's just, to me personally, I think it's a mental grind, especially being as a reliever because it's an everyday thing. I think for starters, it's a little more physical just because, you know, they are going out and throwing seven innings, five days off, do it again. So I, I think it's just a balance of both. And, you know, it's – you know, when you have a good locker room, I'll bring it back up. Um, you know, you go in there, you don't feel as good, but, you know, your boys are there, your friends are there, you know, people you care about are there. You end up feeling a little better. You know, you want to fight. You know, the fight becomes easier. Um, but, yeah, it's nonstop. You know, and so it's – you get used to it, but you never truly get used to it, right? And it's – you got to embrace it, I guess. You know, you got to enjoy the, the ups and the downs because – you know, you are going to struggle. I, I mean, I sucked for a month. I absolutely sucked, but, you know, I stayed in it and, you know, great things came out of it. Talking about that uh, emotional, physical toll, is there somebody in particular that gave you extra headaches that added to that toll this year uh, that you just couldn't seem to get past? Ooh, uh, I mean, listen, my wife keeps me pretty even keeled. <laughs> She's got really good good feel with you know how i'm gonna act based on my performance i guess um you know sometimes it's you know personally I, me i guess you know sometimes i get a little try to do too much you know when you lose the game it's gonna really piss you off especially as a reliever like as a reliever if you pitch if you pitch well you're generally not going to get noticed right until the playoffs the only times you're noticed is if you suck right you lose the game um so like those those moments kind of just stay with you for a while um but but, but hitter wise like is there anybody oh, oh we're anybody talking about that's, just <laughs> molly want me yeah uh, whether whether uh, i you can look at it either this year or just over the course of your career that in particular ooh. have given you a little bit of a headache statistically and i if i i, I had to face them multiple times for me to like really you know sure. put them on my list um i mean the Bregman Correa combo. I don't want to know what Bregman's hitting off me, <laughs> but it's. I bet it's around seven hundred. Um, some. I think he has two doubles, but it's just so frustrating at bat. Yeah, I struck him out in uh, game five, and I just absolutely lost it. It was a ball, absolute ball. Um, probably two balls out of the strike zone. Umpire called it and just straight fist pump just because I got him out. Um, Correa, too. I mean, those two guys just kind of – they just kind of hit the crap out of me. Yeah. That's frustrating, too, because they're both righties. You know, you're supposed to get righties out. Yeah. But, uh, I think I think those two guys probably have the best numbers against me, and it's not really close. What is it about Bregman? Is it is it the short arms? I feel like hitters with short arms can yeah, typically hold their own. I mean, he's a really good hitter in the sense that he has a hole, and he's gonna if if you put it there three times, three out of five, probably gonna get him out. But if you don't execute that pitch in regards to throwing it as a, he might execute a slider, but it's a ball, and he's not gonna swing at it. Um, and so he sticks to his plan. He never gets off of it. And so, you know, you leak one anywhere near the middle of the zone, single. You know, he's he's not a guy that's going to go up and try to hit a nuke, right? So I think those guys are already harder to face just because they're there to do their job, right? And, um, 
you know, and sometimes I just don't execute pitches and he hits them, you know, and I, he knows his role, right? He's two hitter hitting behind uh, Alvarez. He's just trying to set that table so he can do damage. And he's really good at it, you know, and I just can't seem <laughs> to get him out. <laughs> let's, uh, let's shift gears here. Cause I know you don't have too much time, uh, but let's, let's talk uh, this postseason run because I think um, ourselves included, I don't think there was too many people at the start of the year that, projected the season going the way it did especially for you guys and obviously with the way it ended but you get to october you meant we we already talked about coming up a little short there with the division uh speak a little bit to jumping right into it because there is a whole national debate and it's been going on for some time now about the time off versus jumping right into it, the benefits or the pros, the cons to be in a division winning team versus a team that just, like I said, just jumps right into it. You guys were obviously one of those teams. You went to Baltimore, which we were there for. And as, uh, at one point in our lives, pre like nationals and our Red Sox Yankees, uh, fan hoods before those developed, Nate and I were, O's fans. We lived at Camden Yards. So we were hoping, you know, this is exciting for Baltimore. It's exciting for Camden. And you all just rolled in and and just <laughs> swept them out of the building. So that, thank you for that, I guess. I mean, that was, it, it didn't make for a great baseball, but I'm sure you all weren't complaining. <laughs> uh, but speak a little bit to just jumping right into it and, and whether or not you felt that that helped or that hindered your all's years. Yeah, case. I think it's, I mean, there's two viewpoints, I guess. The standpoint of recovery, right? Like you're going to be able to send your guys out. I mean, we were fortunate that our order was pretty close to what we needed needed it to be um, in regards to facing Tampa. We ran out of Aldi and uh, Montgomery, right? So um, or Tampa, so yeah. It, that, I've, for, I've, Tampa, excuse me. I've, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I thought you um, went straight to Baltimore. I completely forgot about uh, the, the race here. Yeah. So, so everyone forgets we lucked about the race. out in regards to our order being right the way we wanted to from the start. So um, I think the only downside, I guess the upside of having five days off is your guys are all fresh um, and you're, you know, your order is going to be right. Your starting, starting staff will be right. Um, the downside is it's different from what you're used to, right? You, you're used to playing every single day, maybe a off day every 10 days or so. Um, so kind of breaking that routine, that schedule, uh, just the mental side of relaxing. You know, you, you turn your brain off for five days. That is a lot of time off. Obviously, you're still going to practice, but it is different. Um, and, you know, obviously – for us coming down into the hunt at the end, I mean, we were, we were kind of just running through arms. We were just trying to, you know, get through it. So with our one day break, we just, you know, we got, we took our off day. Most guys went to practice. We played catch and that was it. Uh, So, but again, it's, it's still routine. You're used to just kind of being in that. Uh, And yeah, so I, I, I get both viewpoints. I, I understand people's issues with it, but Houston didn't have a problem with their first series, right? They they beat Minnesota pretty handedly. Um, so uh, it's it's a tough argument, I guess. You know, and people want to talk about it. They always need something to talk about. And it is worth noting, statistically, those teams are struggling now. And obviously – the MLB is going to want the big teams in there, you know, the Yankees, uh, the Braves, Dodgers. Um, but, you know, it's a sport, right? And you got to win games and it's that simple. You know, it doesn't matter if you have 12 days off or 10 minutes off. You, you just got to win the game and that's that's all it is. You know, keep it simple. Walk um, me through the... That was the only part of that question, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, yeah, I, I was... And like I said, I completely forgot, and I completely forgot about the Rays series. <laughs> yeah. And Nate reminded me, like, yeah, the Rays are a rather forgettable <laughs> team. Because in my head, I had you guys going straight to Baltimore, but yeah, I completely forgot you 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 were in Tampa. So yeah, that makes sense. 
talk to me um, about the facial hair decision. That um, ooh. Oof, I need to know where that came ooh. from. Yeah. Uh, well, in the first two and a half months, I had a stash because I was pitching pretty well. Part of getting hurt. Um, yeah, not don't have a lot of good facial hair anywhere. You know, <laughs> I, I was blessed with this, and my brother was blessed with this, but he has no hair up top, so it's a trade off. Um, if you look at my college world series days, I didn't cut my hair for about two months and it looked awful <laughs> in my hat. Um, so I ended up doing something really weird with my head, I guess. I don't know. Uh, my wife never liked it. <laughs> never has. Um, but you know, uh, let's see. I think we started with, yeah, when we started with Tampa, I was like, I'm going to shave once and I'm not shaving until, until we're done. And sure enough, we kept winning. And sure enough, it kept getting worse. <laughs> Into November, we go. Um, and sure enough, I'm general spores from Civil War. You know, I don't, I don't have anything on my chin. Those chops, man. And Oof. It, it's a bad look. <laughs> you know, if if I had to go back and they said, "Hey, you're going to look really bad on national television, but you're going to win a World Series," I'd do it ten Sign out of ten times. Up. You know. I, I, well, you know, well, no one really, no one really looks bad when they're holding a championship <laughs> trophy. If you're asking me, that's exactly right. And for what it's worth, it, from our point of view, wasn't wasn't too noticeable. Maybe maybe to some, but to me, it looked like you had a pretty strong beard. But you meant now you mentioned the thing about not having anything on the chin. I might have to go back and look and see if it was. Like, yeah, there's oh, there's a gap on like, like the sides of my mouth, and so they don't. Con- I have hair on the chin. It just they don't. True connect. shops. It doesn't connect at all. Um, have you guys seen, I think it was Rookie of the Year, the little kid that throws hard from uh, the clubby in there? He has the same <laughs> thing almost. I got I got called that. And then uh, Marv from Home Alone. Ooh, nice. So, That's I mean, That's honestly, I was pretty – I liked that. <laughs> I, I liked the comps. It, it worked out for me. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I just seem to do something stupid every year. <laughs> Let me let me ask you a little bit about the World Series, and you can be honest. We're not we're not gonna we're not gonna put you on blast here. But as a baseball fan, because like I mentioned, you and I grew up playing baseball together. I knew you you very clearly love the game. As a baseball fan, did did the matchup of the Texas Rangers and the Arizona Diamondbacks move the needle for you guys? Or were you hoping it would have been something, somebody else? Uh, I mean, their team was tricky. Um, you don't play that style of baseball anymore, right? Like that right. is, uh, it, I don't want this to sound disrespectful in any sure. regards of their play, but like it was more of a college ass. We're going to beat you with speed good defense, good pitching. We're going to bunt. We're going to move guys. We're going to hit singles, turn them into doubles. So we were we were pretty worried about them. Honestly, I think we looked at the Phillies or them. The Phillies have a lot of dudes, right? Really good team. But they had a lot of swing and miss. And we, as a pitcher, you like that. This team, not so much. Going to put the ball in play, try to make it hard on you. Um, so uh, – and I think going into watching the Phillies play them, we were a little worried as well. I mean, the Diamondbacks were hot. You know, it's sometimes it's not about how talented you are; it's who's who's playing right at the right time, right? And so we weren't really, you know, thinking, "Oh yes, we lucked out," or "Oh shit, we're 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 playing the best team in the world." You know, I think you know we were gonna just approach it like it's a normal game. You know, we're gonna get a scouting report. We know what they like to do, and we're going to try to adapt. Um, uh, to me, I mean, personally, I don't really hold runners on. So, you know, I was a little worried that they were just going to steal. You know, I lucked out that I only pitched twice in the, in the World Series. Uh, but, yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't like a, oh, yeah, moment. It was just, let's do it again. Let's win it, you know. It, I mean, the playoffs are a month and a half long. You know, when you get there, you might as well freaking win it, right? <laughs> Absolutely, I love it. And I feel like I should have. I feel like I should have let off with this for those who are unfamiliar, because my friend, you put up some fantastic, fantastic numbers this postseason. Uh, Twelve innings pitched, 
He held hitters to a 103 average, just allowed four hits, an ERA of 0.75, only one run allowed, a whip of 0.67, and 13 Ks. That's yeah, quite... that, the one run was Bregman, too, by the way. <laughs> well, well, now we now we know. Now we know. It, it makes a little, a little more sense. A little more sense. But I I wanted to include that because that was a speaking specifically about your work, your body of work that you you put out there. That, that was impressive to watch, and it was cool to see ultimately result in a, at a title. So that was, that was awesome. Yeah. It was got healthy at the right time. You know, I, I think I was blessed that our team had the depth to let me kind of recover. Uh, I mean, I had to go on the aisle for my shoulder right after the all-star break. And then I went on the aisle for my hamstring in September. Um, and listen, I just started feeling good at the right time. You know, I, I was able to recover. They gave me 20 days off. And so for me, it was just getting my hamstring right. Um, I was still having shoulder pain. But, uh, you know, I think you look at my first two or three months of the season, I was pretty close to that. Um, I mean, I think I had a stretch of 17 innings of no runs, 15 innings somewhere. Um, so it was just about getting back to being healthy for me personally. Um, you know, my mental state, it didn't. I think every series I played, the first game of every series, I was a little nervous. But after that, I was cool, calm, collective. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, like I said, I was healthy at the right time. It helps to have a really good defense and it helps to have a really good gold glove catcher. It helps to have a really good offense. You know, like you look at, you look back at that team, there weren't too many holes, especially in a playoff scenario where we can just run dudes out after dude. Um, pretty scary team I think if you look back at it now just kind of pure offense we had I mean Seager was freaking unconscious the entire year I mean good luck facing that guy um you know we have a good thing going him and I he knows that if we face each other I'm gonna throw him a fastball up and away and he's gonna hit it he's gonna hit the crap out of it and we're gonna move on (laughs) just not gonna waste pitches with him (laughs) uh give me a story. <clears throat> I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. Give me a story. I need I need two stories from you. You can keep them somewhat quick if you want. Ooh. What makes Maddox and Bochi Hall of Famers? Ooh. Like firsthand Ooh. story, whether it's from spring training or this year, just a moment where you were like, these two guys are the best to ever do it. I mean, oof. Bochi's a little bit easier in regards to he's the head coach, so he kind of controls everything, right? And I think I've always had a pretty good idea how a bullpen is run, right? I I like to try to prepare so I'm ready to go in the game when I think I'm going to go in. And I think the first thing I learned from him is you're always wrong, so just don't ever think about it. You know, he's he thinks of the game a little differently, and I think – uh, there was one game, I think it ended up being, it was, yeah, Seattle. I was in the fourth inning, a uh, month and a half in the season. And I ended up going two innings, but that was the last time I was like, oh, seventh inning, I'll, I'll wait till then. Uh, just his thought process, I guess. There's no true story with him. I think he's just a genius. I think he sees the game differently. You know, when they talk about Michael Jordan, those kind of guys, you can't you can't teach what he does. You can only appreciate it, right? Like Michael Jordan couldn't teach you how to play basketball because he sees it completely different than any other human. And I think that's that's what Bochi does. I think I think in the playoff time he knows exactly what he wants to do, and he spends all year preparing you for those moments. And that is it. Um, you know, you look at his San Francisco teams, same thing. They just squeak into the playoffs, and then they become the best team every single year. Uh, and I think, especially going into this one, we knew we were a little more confident just knowing that this is what he's accustomed to. This is his game plan. This is what he lives for. Um, I mean, Maddox, let's see. I mean, shoot, he helped me a lot. Uh, stories. Guy's a really good joke teller and loves to play golf. So you're already kind of a good pitching coach right <laughs> I and mean, if you're a pitcher you got you got to play golf and 
I think we had a we had a bingo card of all of his sayings that he'll say during a scan report. I can't say them. <laughs> can't repeat them. I promise. Um, uh, and we played bingo for two or three series, and he loved it. You know, he loved his little sayings. But I don't know. I don't really have a good story for him. But uh, I don't know. As a, as a reliever, you don't necessarily spend that much sure. time with 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 those guys. So we kind of just. We kind of just sit in the bullpen and dick around until the fifth inning comes around. So we're not necessarily locked in the whole time. Well, on that, is there somebody in particular or maybe even two or three guys that you're particularly close with on the team, whether it be, you know, the pen or or elsewhere? I mean, Brock Burke, I think when uh, DeGrom came, when DeGrom got hurt, he started coming down to the bullpen and hanging out with us. Um. I mean, honestly, our bullpen was kind of just cool. We're all the cleric, you know, the Latin speak English. So we're all uh, we're all allowed to have fun. You know, there's no like groups, no posses. Um, I mean, Pico and I are pretty close. The guy's just an absolute, just smiling savage. You know, he's he's the only guy I've ever seen smile in a World Series game during the game. Um, but yeah, I think Burke and I, we played pretty much did everything together. Um, Stratton too. I'd play Burke and ping, ping pong and then I'd play video games with Stratton and it was just kind of carousel back and forth between those two guys. Uh, but yeah, good group, man. Everyone just kind of liked everybody. The old ELE, you know, everybody loved everybody type deal. We just, we did everything together. When we did team dinners, it was 25, 26 guys. You know, everybody wanted to come. I think that's that's why we were good. I gotta ask: Is Chapman like what's what's his deal? Is he just in his own little world all the time? Like I I can't imagine what goes through that guy's head, especially I mean, like on a game day. Listen, he is the most intimidating dude. I think if you, you guys should go back and look at when he hits people, not on purpose. Most time, he rarely hits people with intention. Um, he will walk towards the guy. First thing he does, he did it to McCormick and the Astros. Um, so he's, he's pretty terrifying. And then you get to see him in the in the locker room. And you see him in the gym, and this dude is not warming up and just rolling out 315 squats, just no warm-up. Gets it up to 450, no problem. Incline press, 315, no problem. You know, he just moves weight every single day, and it's, I personally enjoyed it, just watching this dude be a savage in the weight room uh, and throw 102. You know, uh, he is in his own world, but uh, don't pop that cherry because he'll come out. And, <laughs> I mean, we, we got in a little scuffle with Houston, I think. I mean, he was, it may have been Houston. I don't know what team it was, but we he was out there so fast. He He's, he's the guy in the front. Um, Ready for the but, smoke. Happy guy, man. Really happy. Really? Uh, okay. Smile. You know, obviously game time's a little different. Sure. But good teammate. Don't have anything bad to say about him. And if I did, he would come kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. There it is. <laughs> All right, I got an easy one for you. Would you rather have Chris Young's height or Adolis's biceps? Oh man, they're both pretty beneficial to <laughs> being athletic. Uh, I think Adolis' uh, biceps. I think uh, I think there's some struggles with being six <laughs> ten. You know, a lot of doors, a lot of ducking, just a lot more body to move. Um, honestly, I'd take both. But you know, if I had to pick, yeah, good biceps. You know, never hurt on the little beach photos. Have you been um, like, ha- have you, know. you, I'm assuming like MLB guys like kind of intermingle with other athletes, right? Yeah. Like, ha- have you seen Adolis next to a football player and just been like, he, like he could just slide right in. Like he looks like a freaking middle linebacker. Yeah, there was, um, let's see. I got, I came over to the Rangers in 21. And so it was kind of like a week into spring training. So there was no, no spots in the big league locker room for me. 
So I was at the, the minor league side and he sure enough was my uh, locker mate. And I took a look at him, didn't know anybody. And I, I asked myself, I was like, when did we get Adrian Peterson? <laughs> Cause he, he's bald, like same, almost identical build. Obviously, you know, Adrian might've been a little bigger, but, uh, he, he's a specimen. And yeah, I mean, he does all these things. I think that walk off home run he hit against one, game one just showed how athletic he was. Cause it was a pretty bad swing on that ball. Just kind of guessed wrong and he still hit it out opposite field you know three three forty no problem you know he's just an absolute freak those cuban guys man they're they come out a little differently you know when they when they hype those cuban guys up they normally don't miss because they're usually just absolute freaks so you gotta tell me what i mean what is it like pitching in a world series like we've we've talked to guys that Oof. have have played in world series have won world series but i just i have to think that pitching in a world series requires just such a unique mindset especially a late inning leverage guy where like you were talking about the the microscope's going to be on you they're only going to talk about you if you do poorly what i mean what is that what is that like Ooh, I mean, listen, the World Series, both games, I was I was pretty nervous. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, I, I said it before, I was fortunate that I had Jonah I'm calling the game, right? When you have a catcher that absolutely knows every single hitter, it, it, it makes you think a lot less. And I think that's the biggest issue in baseball is yourself. You know, you, if you get in your own head, you're toast. You have no chance. So, I mean, I essentially just try to turn my brain off. Don't think. Just execute that pitch. Worry about what happens next, you know. Uh, and just kind of being overly simple, compartmentalize things to the, to the sense of if I throw this curveball, I'm going to throw it as hard as I can in the location that I want it. And that's it. Not not going to worry about the guy in first. Not going to worry about the guy in second. Um and just keeping it again abundantly simple. Uh, like I said, when you have that, when you have the ability, I mean, I have pretty good stuff. You have elite trust in your your catcher and your defense. It makes it a lot easier. I mean, there's nothing worse than you guys played than having a bad catcher and pitching, or having a bad defense and pitching. You, you're going to try to do too much. Bad things happen. You know, in this league, they don't miss. You know, you hang a pitch, they do not miss the ball. And if they do, you lucked out, and you know you did. Um, so, yeah, just keeping it simple. Uh, don't let the moment get too big. You know, worry about that one guy. I think the cool thing with this, with the playoffs, is you're not really going to face too many guys, right? You you show a sense of weakness, you're going to get taken out of the game immediately. Uh, and so just knowing that, these three guys are probably the only three guys I'm going to face. That's it. Let's, let's get them. And the scouting reports are obviously a little better too. So it helps. Well, I saw it. You mentioned the three guys, uh, that you assume you would face. I saw they interviewed you shortly after the game. Uh, and you were talking about how, if you thought you were going to come out for the ninth, you wouldn't have fist pumped the eighth. So it's safe to assume that you, cause I, Myself, Nate and I, we were going back and forth about it as we're watching the game. We're like, is Spores really, really about to come back out here for the ninth? And sure enough, I think to the surprise of just about everyone. Everybody. Uh, me, me, myself <laughs> yeah. included. Okay. I, so I wanted to wanted to confirm that you you certainly just were completely. So aware. yeah, it was we scored, I think it was one nothing. All right. Yeah. One nothing going into the ninth. He had told me that I was going back out. So in my mind, Perdomo was up first. I was a, I was a, I thought personally I was a better matchup for him than Leclerc was. Right, uh, not as good on curveballs, a little bit better on sliders, changeups. So I, I knew right off the bat if I was going out, it was just going to be him. Right, we ended up scoring five, so four runs. So it was a little different. The, the game changed. Um, and then got him out. I think struck out looking. 
Then Carroll comes up. Not a super good matchup for me. I don't have anything that's going to – he's more of a change-up heater guy. Um, don't throw a change-up. Only pitch against him is a curveball, and he hits him pretty good with his little scoop swing. Um, thank God he hit that fastball up, fouled it off to the catcher. I was running out of gas. Um, and then they didn't come out, so I was like, well – might as well finish this shit. <laughs> um, uh, Marte also another not a great matchup against me. Uh, it's a pesky think, bunch, man. That I mean they yeah. you're, you're talking about it. That they they don't get out easy. The, there was a reason they were there. It wasn't like a shock to everybody. We played them. We played them four games. They beat us three times in the regular season, and it's, it's you, you don't play against that team. It's it's different. Um, you know, obviously, I went to I went to Virginia. Um, and our, when our basketball team won, it's the same thing as like, you're just not used to that type of focus on defense, right? We look at basketball more of an offensive thing. Um, they just, they did stuff that no one else really in the league does. Um, and it's, it's what, it's why they were there. It wasn't, like I said, they were leading that division for most of the season. They just kind of, the Dodgers got hot. They had some injuries. So it was a little... It, it, to us, we we knew they could be there. They deserved it. Um, but yeah, Kettle. I think I, I think I had two career uh, at bats he does against me, and I think I've walked him on twice on nine pitches. Pretty uncompetitive at bats. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think I really threw him too many good pitches either that at bat. Um, just kind of like some loopy high curveballs. I mean, I was running off you, <laughs> you know. Just yeah. not. I knew. I knew. Like we were that one out away. Jonah was in behind home plate, telling me to breathe. Um. But yeah, I think I threw another hanging curveball, and he took it, and there was a celebration, you know. But yeah, I never thought for a second I was ever going to pitch tonight. I think uh, Leclerc had closed out every single game we won, so I figured they were going to give it to him. But. Um, it's cool how it worked out. You know, I was happy I got to finish. Uh, so I was out the first championship for the Rangers. Um, but yeah, everybody was shocked, just as myself included. Have you talked to anybody like super, super cool since this has happened? Like, have you been starstruck by somebody after winning it? Ooh, um, I got to talk to, you know, I, I guess in baseball world, I think I've always thought Joe Madden was an interesting guy. And I got to go on his podcast, and he's another one of those guys that's just an outside thinker. And I, I just wanted to pick his brain because he's just – he's out there. And I think, you know, people are always afraid of the unknown, but I've always liked to explore it. Never really been afraid to kind of do – and for me, pitching stuff like weird lifts, you know, things like that. I, I've always just tried to embrace it because there's always a different viewpoint and, you know, just being open-minded to things. Obviously, you got to be in control, but – um being open-minded to something could change your life. Um, but, you know, no one crazy, I guess. I mean, the thing with celebrations, they're so short, right? So um, you don't really, you don't get to really go out to the clubs. I mean, I have two kids, so, you know, you know, my, my parties when I come <laughs> home, you know, that's what I live for. Um, but, yeah, no one crazy. I thought he was a pretty interesting guy. Uh I think our I think our team kind of we didn't really let too many guys in. We got to meet Bush, George W. Um, he came to a few games. Uh, I thought that was cool. Shook his hand. Good dude. Um, but yeah, no one crazy. Uh, I wish I had somebody cool to say, but no. Nolan Ryan, <laughs> like, did have you? I'm assuming you've had a convo with him, right? Shaking his hand. Yeah. Can uh, I can I just jump in here real quick? Where was I? Completely oblivious to where he was at because I feel like any other Rangers game I'd watch, I feel like they always show him sitting in the seats, but I can't think of a single time where I saw them actually show where he, he might was have at. been. He might've been in the suites with the okay. owners. Um, there's some bad blood, not, not with the Rangers, but mm. um, some past things happened, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not the one to talk about it. I don't <laughs> know. I just know there was a little rift, I guess. Sure. Um, but it'd be hard to believe that he didn't come to those games. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, guy was a Texas Ranger. I mean, arguably the best pitcher ever. You know, I guess 
just just an absolute dog through five thousand innings, five thousand strikeouts. I mean, but yeah, I, I you know it's it's sad because that's one guy I, I really haven't met. Mm. I would love to just hear him speak. Um, but I'm hoping that changed now that you know the dynamics have shifted a little bit in regards to our our staff and. You know, we are not a 100-loss team. We are a 98-94 win team with a World Series champion. So I'm hoping hoping that changed. I know you got that, – that's a picture behind you, right, of him? Oh, oh. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's him. Um, take me in, – I mean, I'm sure you've gotten asked this question like a thousand times, but take me inside your mind the strike to end it, glove spike – I'm I'm assuming you just blacked out like what take me take me through your um, yeah up there. Uh, let's see I mean my heart rate was pumping you know you can you can taste that victory and I think I was lucky because it was a five run lead so I got to like kind of savor it a little bit um, but I saw Daniel Hudson do it with the Nationals the glove spike and I absolutely loved it. I never really thought about a celebration. Right? I didn't think, like I said, I didn't think I was going to be the last guy to get the out. Um, so yeah, that was the first thing that came to my head, glove spike and then run to the catcher. But that distance between the catcher, Jonah and I, it felt like it was a 30 minute ordeal just getting to him. It felt like everything just kind of stopped slow motion. Um, and then getting back to Chapman, you know, we, we were jumping up and down, and the first dude running at me was him. And if you see me, like, you know, I'm jumping with Jonah, and then I start jumping away because I was afraid he was going to tackle me. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, just like you said, blackout. You just – it's something you dreamed of your whole life, something you've, you know, you worked for your entire life, and – uh, we had guys that had 16, 17 year careers and this is their first one. So, you know, I think that was the approach, you know, I was fortunate to play with Ian Kennedy, you know, just his outlook of, you know, you might only get this one opportunity. This might be your only time you ever go to the playoffs ever again. So one, enjoy it. Don't, don't get lost in the good and the bad, just enjoy the moment. Uh, and I think that's, that was the approach overall. I tried to take just, you know, I guess getting back to having some of these veterans on this team kind of guide us. And that was a big aspect for me was just live in the moment, appreciate it. You know, you get to be with your family, his family, my whole family was there. My wife's family was there. You know, that, that doesn't really happen. You know, I think you get a little older, it becomes a little harder, but you know, everybody showed up for this big moment and you know, those were the special moments. Um, you know, the championship was great, but, you know, doing it with my wife and my kids, that, that that's that's what you play for. You know, things kind of shift in regards to you play for yourself, but now you, I, I play for my family, and that makes it easier to play and gives you something to fight for. I love it. My last question, then when I'm, uh, I'm all done. The dream 7-8-9 trio, all-time, current guys, past guys, you plug huh. yourself in however you want in the 7-8-9. Who are the other two? I mean, I'm going to tickle your fancy a little bit with Mariano Rivera. Sure, sure. That's fair. That's, that's I appreciate kind of automatic. it. Um, ooh, I mean, you have Hoffman, Eckersley. Uh, I, I like a sneaky one, uh, Billy Wagner. Ooh, I like that. I like you know, that. I don't think he gets. Uh, I don't think he gets enough credit for how good he was. You're probably right. So, I, and if we're I'll talking go, like I'll lanes go. too, like if you're if you're gonna set yourself up for seven eight nine, trying to get different lanes, different yeah. strengths. I mean, not, if we're going left, right, left, yeah. or right, left, right. Uh, definitely. I mean, can't really think of another lefty that was as dominant as him. Um, you know, if we're gonna go this year. Um, Shoot the uh, Orioles closer, um, Batista. 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 Before yeah. his injury, man, that dude was bowling balls. Listen, when guys came in, they were like, "Don't know what's coming. Everything's the same." He throws. I mean, if we're looking at data on his heater, it's it's an absolute insane unicorn of a pitch. Seven feet of extension, 
a hundred miles an hour, hundred miles an hour, twenty plus vert. You know, it's if we're gonna nerd out, I think. It's, and then you, you you throw that that splitter he throws. It's kind of a joke, honestly. <laughs> Like it can't be that fun to pitch when you're that good. Like just having those two uniform pitches. <laughs> um, yeah, that, those three guys would probably not lose too many games. I think um, you could sprinkle me in like the fifth inning because that's probably where I'd be. <laughs> It'd be a pretty relaxing year, I guess. Cause <laughs> yeah. You know they're going to finish everything out. Last question I got for you, and you kind of just alluded to it, albeit jokingly, but I, you, you mentioned pitching the fifth. We obviously know you closed out the World Series this year. Speak, uh, like I said, just to close us out here, on the evolution of your career to this point. Like, what is, what is something that you've taken away from your time in the league thus far? What's something maybe you've learned about yourself? Um or what's maybe a way in which you've grown as a, as a pitcher, as a competitor, whatever it may be. I think uh, just in sports, like you're going to have however many coaches, right? 20 coaches probably in your career. I don't think one coach is going to change your life. I think, I think my approach, if I had to go back was take, you know, the best thing that that coach has and learn from that. And that's it. When you meet a new coach, best thing, move on. I think for me, I kind of got a little closed minded in pitching and just kind of, you know, these are my three pitches. I'm never going to change them. I don't make it. So be it. Um, and I think, let's see, 20, I made it to the big leagues kind of with that mindset, never really changed much. Um, really struggled in 19, 20, I was okay. Um, but you know, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to stick around with what I had. So took a risk, did some crazy stuff for throwing, come back throwing 97, 98, um, sitting there, uh, you know, have a decent year in 21. You know, I, I don't think people talk about stick enough. I mean, a lot of guys were using it, right? I would say 90% of the league. Um, mm-hmm. Curveball goes – my curveball was pretty bad. Never really changed before. Like I was, like I said, same grip. Spin rates weren't crazy. Um, uh, let's see. Come June 2022, new curveball grip. And uh, Kyle, I don't know if you remember. It was kind of a big 12-6 prior. A little mm-hmm. slow. Just a yep. big one. Um, I always thought it was cool because I could see it move. But never really good. Could never really strike it. We throw this weird grip, spike curveball, and I think pretty much kind of changed my career. I think, I mean, you look at my pitches, they're all good, but my curveball is like my true outlier pitch. Um, so just being open-minded, I said that before, but like, but obviously you always got to stay guarded, but, you know, listen to what people have to say. It might be out there, it might be different, but it could also change your career. Um, so like for me, it's just learn, understand how a coach operates and use what they're really good at. I think one thing with Maddox is he's one of the best scouting report coaches I've ever seen. Just kind of, he's obviously a coach forever, played the big leagues forever. Um, but he's, I know that when he talks about a hitter swing, I need to listen. I know it's going to make me better as a player. And, you know, obviously when my, career ends i'll be a better coach because of it so just taking little things from everybody you know don't un, uncoachable isn't a word but but you know just taking small aspects wherever you go even 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 if it's just a little nugget it, it could change um and you know if you're paying attention you'll know who the bad ones are you'll know who the bad coaches are bad people and so just being aware little nuggets Pretty simple. Nothing crazy. And I think you kind of use that for life. It's kind of the way I've seen it. I was just about to say, that's good baseball <laughs> advice, good life advice. Uh, that's about all I got. Nate, you got anything that's else it, for, man. for Josh? Thank you so much, Josh. World champion, yeah, Josh World Spores. World champion. savor it for another two months and then <laughs> Love it, restart. man. Love it. Hey, that's yours. That's yours until next November. That's all All yeah. you guys. That's all That's all yours till next November. So well, We get those it. cool little gold 
badgers on our on our um there you go now. there you go love it well josh we appreciate you coming on congratulations and uh a heck of a heck of a run this year and best of luck in yeah the, in the years thank to you come. guys thank you for having me on